Good day students, so welcome to part 6 of the Integrated Algebra Regents exam for January 2013. In this installment, we're going to be going over questions 26 through 30. Alright, let's take a look at question number 26. It says, uh, given the two sets, A is the perfect square integers from 4 to 100 inclusive, and B is 16, 36, 49, and 64, the complement of set B in the universal set A is as well. So, uh, first of all, how about we have a better idea as to what the elements of set A are so we can actually compute what the complement of set B is um, in the universal set A. Uh, so um, set A is the squares, perfect squares from 4 to 100. So we know that um, 2 square is equal to 4. That's, this is the uh, lowest um, square root that generates the lower bound of this set and then um, the upper bound the number you square to get 100 is 10 right so 10 square equals um, 100 so all the integers squared from 2 to 10 will give us the elements of set a okay so we start from 2 2 square is 4 which is where you start from and then to generate the rest we're just going to keep squaring 3 4 5 6 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, when we square this, 10 square is 100. All right, so the squares of all these numbers, all these integers, we generate the elements of set A, including 4 and 100, of course, okay? All right, so 3 square is 9, 4 square is 16, 5 square is 25, 6 square is 36, 7 square is 49, 8 square is 64, and 9 square is 81, okay? All right, so that goes set A, so let's list them. Set A is um, squiggly bracket 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and 100, all right? So there you have it. And then set B is, um, is the Let's order it. 16, 36, 49, and 64. Alright, so that's set B. Now, what on earth is a complement? The complement of B in the universal set A is all the elements in set A that are not in B. Okay? Basically, we can uh, use this uh, equation to capture what the meaning is. Um, the reason why we can do that basically is because B is a proper subset of A. Everything in B is A. So we can simply comp compute B complement as set A minus B. And this will basically help us determine uh, what, what the uh, complement of, of B and set A is. All right? So, um, so B complement, if we look at these two, we can simply determine what B complement are. What are the elements in A that are not in B? Let's cross out the elements that are in both of them, right? That are in the intersection. So we see if we, if we subtract A from B, uh, B from A, these two cancel out. These two cancel out because they are in both sets. Both uh, sets, yeah, and these two cancel out and those two cancel out. So the complement um, of set B in the universal set A are the elements you have left. So they are four, 9, 25, 81, and 100, okay? Let me show you another way to represent this. We can use the Venn diagrams to capture um, what the complement is. So we have a universal set A, okay? So I'm going to represent that with a circle. So we have the universal set A. Now, um, the elements of set A, the universal set, are... Uh, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and 100. Okay? So this is set A right here. Label it set A. Now, set B uh, is basically... Um, is uh, 16, 36, 49, 64. So right here, this is set B, okay? 
So we can see that set B is, uh, an, is a proper subset of set A. So this right here is set B, okay? So when we're talking about the complement of B, it's basically everything in A that's not in B. So how do we do that? We just simply cross out everything in B because B is a proper subset of A or everything in B is in A. So if we simply cross out everything in B, that is in A, basically their intersection, the elements we have left on the outside represents the complement of B. So it's 4, 9, 25, 81, 100. So this is another way of, of looking at it. So this outside piece is the complement of B, all right? So um, our answer is um, number two, okay? So there you have it. All right, let's take a look at question number 27. So the expression 2x squared plus 10x minus 28 over 4x plus 28 is equivalent to. So let's uh, um, extract the numerator and denominator, simplify them as much as possible, and then it will be easy for us to cancel out the common factors. All right, so let's extract the numerator first and factor that completely. Okay, all right, so the numerator is 2x squared plus 10x. Minus 28. This is a quadratic trinomial. We can factor this by grouping. Um, so we noted that 2 is common in all three terms, so we can factor that out. So we have 2 times x squared plus 5x minus 14. Now I'm going to factor this using the x game. Uh, so we'll make our little x. It's called x game or AC method. I have a a long a three part tutorial on this on mathlaserve.com. You can go and view it to master this process of uh, factoring by grouping. Okay. All right, AC goes on the top, which is negative 14, and B goes on the bottom, which is 5, because we have A, B, C here. And you want two numbers multiplied to give you negative 14 and actually give you 5, 7, and negative 2. Work. So we're going to put that in the center. We have 2 times x squared um, plus 7x minus 2x minus 14. Break it down the center of factor by grouping. All right, so from the first two, let's leave this two on the outside, okay? I can take out an x, and you're left with x plus 7. And then from the second two, I can take out a negative 2, and I'm left with x plus 7, like that. All right, so these two terms that are similar, I can factor them out together. So we have uh, 2 times x plus 7, and then um, we're left with x minus 2, okay? Times x minus 2, and that goes the factored form for the numerator, all right? So this expression can be written as 2 times x plus 7, times x minus 2 as a numerator. Now in the denominator, uh, what we're going to do is factor it, okay, as much as we can. It's not a quadratic, so we don't have to employ uh, the factoring by grouping um, algorithm there. So in the denominator, denominator, uh, we have 4x plus 28. So I can factor out 4 since the common factor of these two take out 4. We're left with x plus 7. So there goes the factored form of the denominator, okay? All right, so let's put it back in. We have 4 times x plus 7. Now it's easy for us to see what the common factors are so we can reduce it, okay? So uh, x plus 7 goes here once, x plus 7 goes here once, 2 goes here once, 2 goes here twice. Your final answer is x minus 2 over 2. So final answer is option number 1. All right, let's move on to question 28. It says, which of the, uh, what of x is solution to the equation? So we have this equation right here, 1 over 7. Uh, plus 2x over 3 equals 15x minus 3. All right, so in order to make, this problem looks really complicated because of the denominators. So if we can get rid of the denominators, uh, then it will be a much easier equation to solve. So in order to do that, what we simply have to do is multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD of the denominators, okay? So what is the LCD? L7, 3, and 21. That's the question. What is the LCD? The LCD is clearly 21. That is the smallest number that all three can go into. Okay? All right, so we're going to multiply every single term by 21, and that should get rid of the denominator because each denominator goes into that number. All right? 
So times is by 21, times is by 21, times is by 21. Okay? All right, the first term, 7 goes here once. 7 goes here three times. Here, 3 goes here once, 3 goes here seven times. And then over here, the 21s just cancel out. Okay, so now we have 3 plus 2x times 7 is 14x equals 15x minus 3. 15x minus 3. Okay? All right, so what we want to do now is basically get the um, x isolated, and that will be the... The, about the, the number on the right side will be the solution, okay? All right, so to isolate the x, um, how about we move 14x to the right, so we have a positive x value, and move the constant number here to the left, okay? So I'm going to subtract 14x from both sides, and while I add it, we can add 3 to both sides. So this will move the 14 to the right, and the negative 3 to the left. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and do it. Um, this over here we have 6 equals, this add up to 0, minus 14 plus, I mean 15 minus 14 is just x, and those cancel out, so you can see that x equals 6 is our answer, and the correct answer is option number 1, alright, so there you go. Okay, number 29, doing some statistics here, um, we're asked to compare, but we're comparing a uh, combination of the mean, median, and mode. You just compare in pairs um, to see which uh, which which of the statements is actually accurate. Okay, so we have to find all three first, and then we are going to compare them individually. So let's start out by looking for the uh, mean. The mean is basically uh, the sum of elements divided by what? Divided by the number of elements. Okay the sum divided by the number of elements. Okay, so to sum it up, we just add all these elements together. 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 6. Actually, I'm running out of space here. Uh, plus 6 plus um, 7 plus 9 plus 12. This is the sum of all the elements divided by the number of elements. How many elements do we have? Or how many elements are we adding? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, plus 7, okay? When you add that in your calculator, um, you get 49 over 7, which equals 7. So there goes your mean. Your mean is 7, okay? Now, uh, mode. Mode is the most, the one that element that repeats itself the most, okay? So we have 1, 4, 1, 5, 2, 6s, 1, 7, 1, 9, 1, 12. So which one repeats itself the most? It's 2, right? So the mode is 6, I'm sorry. 6 is the mode because it, its frequency is higher than the others. It, it occurs twice, so the mode is 6, okay? So most frequently occurring element in this set is your mode, okay? Your mean is a cent is a is an element in the center when it's ordered, okay? So mean is a, uh, I'm sorry, median. <laughs> really did mean. Uh, median is a center element of the ordered set. Okay, median is basically uh, the middle of the ordered set. Okay. All right, so what is it? Is it ordered first of all? 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12 is already ordered. It could be ascending or descending order. This ordering uh, pro uh, pattern is, is in an ascending order from the smallest to the biggest. So that's good. So let's look for the center, the one in the center. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so uh, the midpoint is going to be six, okay? So six in the middle. Well, how do I know? You can start counting from the outside. So take one step in from here, take one step in from here, take another step in here, take another step in here. So you see you're left with six in the center. So if you're counting from outside to the inside, that should tell you uh, what the middle the middle number is okay if you had two numbers in the center then you just average them that'll tell you what the what the median is okay so the median number is always the one in the center if you have an odd number you always have a unique uh median if it's even number of elements instead then you have to always have to average your two center ones okay all right so six is in the center so the median is six okay now let's compare them together uh mean is Seven mode is six, and guess what? The mode is also equal to the median, huh? So guess we can actually tell what the answer is. It's gonna be 
function number two because the mean and the mode are equal. Okay? Is the mean less than the median? Is seven less than six? No. Is the mean equal to the mode? No. The difference is the mode greater than the mean. The mode is six. The mean is seven. It's not greater than less. So the answer is option two. All right? Okay. Now let's take a look at question 30. It says, how is the graph? y equals x squared plus 4x plus 3 affected when the coefficient of x squared is changed to a small positive number. So let's write down the general form. So if you have y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, um, the if the absolute value of a gets bigger, guess what? It has an inverse relationship. The graph, <coughs> the graph, gets narrower, okay? And the opposite is true, the inverse is true, vice versa. If it gets smaller, then the graph gets wider. So there's an inverse relationship between the size of A and the, the width of the graph, the size of the absolute value of A, okay? And what is C? C equals your y-intercept, okay? So in this problem, we are told that A is getting smaller, there's a smaller positive number, okay? So if A is getting smaller and it's positive, so we don't have to consider the absolute value. Since A is getting smaller, that means that the graph is going to get wider, okay, because there's an inverse relationship. If A gets bigger, the graph gets narrower. If A gets smaller, the graph gets wider. So in this case, A is getting smaller, so the graph is going to get wider, all right? So we're going to take out options three and four. All right, so the question now is... Um, how does the alteration of the value of a or the coefficient of x squared affect the y-intercept? Because if you look at these two options, one and two, the only difference is that one has y-intercept staying the same and the other has y-intercept changing. So the question is, was three changed in this problem? Absolutely not. Three, which is the value of the y-intercept, stayed the same. Hence, even though the graph gets wider, the y-intercept stays the same. So our answer is option number two. Okay? So there you have it. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. You can feel free to subscribe to my channel by clicking here for more updates, updates to subsequent um, installments. Please click like if you like this presentation and post a comment to let me know what you think. More clips coming from macroserve.com. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.